we will be entering into a time of Q&A. Um, anyone is allowed to ask a question, but please let it be a question that is relevant to Dr. Turk's presentation, and also please keep it relatively short in the interest of uh, allowing other people to ask questions. Um, again, if you want to have more conversation on this, I'm sure you can hang out afterwards or come to club. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, have a line here. So if you have a question, you can come please get in line um, and ask your question. So come on forward. How you doing? Pretty good. How are you? Good. What's your name? My name's John. We've hey. actually talked before about four years ago. Oh, all right. How you doing? Are you still a student here? I'm a master's student, actually. Oh, all right. What are you majoring in? Biology. Cool. All right. Uh, see, I don't think you proved your point that the creator's personal. I'm sorry? I don't think you proved that the creator's personal. That your God, or that the thing that created the universe was personal. That it, oh, okay, the, why not? Why do you think not? Um, let me just uh, quote William Lane Craig. I think you know him. I mm -hmm. think every Christian here probably does. Uh, this is in response to the idea of quantum vacuuming, that particles appear in, you know, sure. without uh, any cause. He says, if a causal condition is sufficient for, uh, for the phenomenon, the phenomenon will happen, therefore, or causally su uh, sufficient. So he's saying that there is still a cause because there's a cause, uh, causally sufficient uh, you know, matrix for this to happen within. Okay. Would you agree with that? Well, I'd have to unpack what he meant by that. Well, but he's saying like just if, because, hang on, just, just because you have a sufficient um, uh, condition doesn't mean you're necessarily going to have a cause. Well, like, but, for example, you might have leaves uh, and you might even have a match, but if you never get the two together, you're not going to have a fire, right? Well, his, uh, he goes on to say that it's like water at freezing, that it, there, is no there is no personal cause to it. It's just that the okay, sure, that, yeah. that it meets the criteria for frozen waters at the, you know, the temperature is zero degrees. Exactly, yeah, yeah. And that, that's his response to the idea of uh, that va you know, quantum vacuums can create uh, particles which could go on to create the universe. Would you? Now, my problem with okay. that, Hang on, John. That's a good question. The quantum vacuum question. And as you know, Dr. Craig uh, deals with that question quite a bit uh, on the quantum vacuum. Well, my, my, I'm going to relent the point that that could be true, that if, that it, if something is sufficient for something to uh, happen, it can happen. Okay, the, the problem is, let me, let me just deal with the quantum issue because it's a, good, it's a good objection to bring up because many atheists, of course, bring it up that there's a quantum vacuum out there. But first of all, at the quantum level, subatomic particles do not come into being out of nothing, non-being. The subatomic vacuum is comprised of fluctuating energy. So it's not nothing. It still is something. The question is, what created the quantum vacuum? And Lawrence Krauss's book, which talks about a universe from nothing, he equivocates on what the word nothing means. In fact, even an atheist from Columbia University pointed that out to him in the New York Times, which really frosted Dr. Krauss. Mm -hmm. But he was pointing out that the subatomic realm is not nothing. It's still needs to be created. So even if there is a subatomic realm and there are these apparent uncaused uh, uh, causes or, or uncaused effects coming out of it, does not mean that the universe could be one of those causes because it still would require the cause of the subatomic realm. Also, it's highly speculative. There are at least 10 different interpretations of quantum mechanics. Some are deterministic, some are not. And according to Victor Stenger, there's no consensus as to what the right one is. This also may be an issue of unpredictability rather than uncausality. Well, I'm, I'm willing to grant all those points okay. for, for this. What's that? I'm going to make it as quick as possible. But okay. here, here are my premises that I believe uh, show that, that you haven't proved that there's a personal God. It's, uh, the universe has a beginning. I'm willing to grant that. Uh, God's willingness to create the universe is eternal. I'm willing to grant that point. Uh, God's willingness to create the universe is causally sufficient for the, the existence of the universe. I'm willing to grant that point. Uh, if the cause is eternal and sufficient for the existence of, the, uh, of something, uh, then the thing is also eternal. Um, if the thing is eternal, that, does, uh, that means it doesn't have a beginning. Therefore, the universe does not have a begin does and does not have a beginning, thus breaking the law of non-contradiction. Uh, the idea is that without time, you can't say that God, you know, it's like Aristotle, at one point he's sitting down and he plans to stand up and he stands up, that without time you can't demarcate change. So well, God doesn't there, change, so there why? No, well, there's no point where the God, God is creating, there, or there's a point where God is both not creating and creating the universe according no, the, to... The, the point at which he creates the universe is simultaneous with the creation of the universe. So time is created at the beginning, just as 
the argument that I put up there earlier was, just as the Bible talks about. And so God, when he creates, and we're using temporal language because we're in time when I say when he creates, that's when the space-time continuum is created. So it's simultaneous with his creation event is when time begins. Yeah, but that, that's a nonsensical argument. You Why is it nonsensical? Because the cause can't be simultaneous to its effect. Give me an example within... within oh, sure. You see that projector right there? Yep. That, that projector is being simultaneously uh, held by the bolts and that rod to the ceiling. Okay. The, but the cause is simultaneous to that projector being held in, but the, it in wasn't, the air. It wasn't being held before it was bolted on. Well, there was a point when it began, that's true, but right now that cause is simultaneous with its effect. Yeah, but you're saying that this cause has no, uh, and it has nothing before it. So you, God has nothing before it because God's outside of time. In fact, this is, this is even known through general relativity. In fact, this is from the, uh, hold on, let me see if I can find it here. This is from the Stanford Encyclopedia of... Last. Philosophy, which your own esteemed Dr. Tim McGrew has, who's sitting in the back here, has actually contributed to, particularly on the subject of miracles. This is not his article, but this is what uh, the article says. The theory of relativity is generally taken to support the idea that the universe is a four-dimensional space-time block, that time is a matter of perspective, and that an ideal knower outside the universe would observe it all at once. So this is not illogical to believe this. But John, we can talk more after if you want. That's fine. Anybody else? I'm going to ask real quick, anyone who has a question, if you could stand up and remain standing. Um, we're, going to, we're going to bring people down down here, but I, I'm going to need to see how many people have questions just for pacing purposes. So, yeah, so we've got someone coming here. If, yeah, come on up. If anyone else has a question, just stand up and come down the aisle. Sir, you don't need to bring all your books with you. <laughs> What's your name? Tankara. Say again? Tankara. Tankara. Nice to meet you. Go ahead. Well, uh, I saw in the slides that uh -huh. you just qualified the pantheism and atheism uh, mm -hmm. as they are wrong. Mm -hmm. Why? Why is pantheism and atheism wrong? Were you here for the whole presentation? Yep. Okay. Because the law of non-contradiction, if, if it is true that a theistic God exists, then it's not true that the universe is God or that there is no God. Yeah, but the point's like, for example, that's your assumption, right? And the assumption of people that believe in this way of religion. And in the other hand, the other religions, the other paths also have their own support and basis. Well, that's true, but you have to look at each... That's why you are not able to qualify. Why you qualify the others? I, I don't understand what you mean. Why do I qualify the others? You qualify them as wrong. Well, you're qualifying me as wrong right now. No, I'm saying sure what, you, are. You, you're, you're what saying, you did. You're saying what I just said yeah. to say that theism was true and the others were false is wrong. Yeah. So you're doing the same thing that you're accusing me of doing. We're all doing that. The question is That's what's first, true. right? You did that first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, so, be, because I'm giving. That's what the, I mean. Yes, that's I'm. What I mean. You yes, see? I'm giving the lecture, so I'm going to go first. That's true. <laughs> yeah, that's what. But I the mean. point is, is that we're all making truth claims here. The pantheist, the atheist, the theist. We're all making truth claims. The question is, what is true? Now, let me submit to you that. What you have? Yes. What's that? I said in the, based on what you state here. Yes, of course. Based yes. on what they have, also they are true. So why are we judging them, as you said? <laughs> we, when we make truth claims, we make judgments, yes. You're making a judgment right now. So it's unavoidable. But we can make judgments without being judgmental, right? I'm open to evidence. If there's evidence that say pantheism is true or atheism is true, I'm open to it. Yeah, but it's the same as, as, we, as you were discussing here. There is not enough evidence for it everything, right? I think there's enough evidence to believe that Christianity is true. But every individual person has to assess the evidence for themselves. We have free will. Mm -hmm. We have minds. We're supposed to make the assessment ourselves because God's not going to force us to believe. He leaves it open to us in order to believe or not believe. It's up to us. 
Yeah, but it's in some parts in the world, right? It's not just everywhere in the world. What's everywhere in the world? What? China, India, Asia, even in the Amazon, in the Andes. There are different, many, many kinds of religions. Oh, religion. I'm sure there are. But everybody has the same evidence that there's a creator uh, God. Not the same evidence. Yes, but everyone they, has. They have their own evidence. Everybody right? has the same evidence that there's a creator and a moral creator. Because everybody has creation. Everybody has conscience. So everybody knows there's a creator God who's a moral God. They don't know necessarily about Jesus, and we haven't even gotten there in this seminar yet. They don't need to. Well, if Jesus is who he said he was, if he is God, they do need to know about him. But they don't need to. Why not? Because they have their own... No, but that. what if Jesus really is God? Who is Jesus? Well, who is he? He is the second person of the Trinity who added humanity over his deity to come to earth, live a perfect life in our place, die in our place, take the punishment of our sins on himself, so when we trust in him, we, don't, we won't be punished by God's unchanging justice. That's who he claims to be. That's who I think he is. And if it were true, would you become a Christian? No. Why not? <laughs> because, as I said... Let me rephrase that. Every, if every, it were true, really, that Jesus was God, would you become a Christian? No. Why? Why not? Because it is an assumption and a religion that was... No, 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 I'm not saying it's an assumption or religion. Yeah, Let's yeah, say yeah, it's really let, let true. Let me finish. Let me finish. Okay. Because it was in a different part of the world, right? It comes from a culture, just from a society there. And as we know, as we were talking about human rights and everything, common sense and what's the truth, every society has the truth in their own way. So that's what, why do we have to believe in this? Or why do I have to be Christian, if, even if it is true? OK, well, the, the reason is, if it is true, it's because everybody is a sinner, no matter where they come from. And Jesus is the only way that our sin can be paid for if we don't pay for it ourselves, because he's the only innocent sacrifice. See, if God is just, he has to punish sin. If he doesn't punish sin, he's not just. So he punishes a innocent substitute in our place. That's why Christ came. That's why he entered humanity in order to save us. So that's the purpose of life, is to know him and to make him known. And I invite you to at least, why don't, would, would you do this at least? Would you just say, go read the Gospel of John and pray that God would reveal to you that he really is Jesus, that Jesus really is who he said he was. Would you do that? You can give him the mic back, Kat. Go ahead. <laughs> 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 yeah, probably because I am curious. I, I'm sorry? I'm curious. Uh -huh. I want to know. Okay, more good. And deep. Yeah, and in fact, if I gave you a book, would you read it? Probably. But. Wait! Uh, <laughs> but Did you say probably? Probably, yeah. But if I. Would you do it? Because I don't give probablys. <laughs> That's my point. Would you? If, if I gave it to you. I gave it to you. Would you read it? <laughs> if I, I want to learn more, yeah, sure. Okay, I'll give it to you. But, <laughs> but Rick in the back. No buts. <laughs> <laughs> All right, if, if, you, if you have one more thing to say, go ahead, Kat. Just give, give. Is there somebody else? Okay. Whoever has a question can, can come forward. That's fine. Thank you, sir. Oh, okay. <laughs> and thanks for, thanks for your question. Oh, thank you. Thank All you right. for accepting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK. Do we have anyone else? OK. Oh, come on up. <laughs> Yes, sir. What's your name? My name is Matt. Hey, Matt. Hello. Nice to meet you. You too. Um, so Matthew, we, by the way, means 
gift from God. You know that? You're welcome. <laughs> so, um, my, my question is, um, you are of the conclusion that the, the statements of the Christian Bible are, is, is the true account of, of, you know, why we're here. Sure. Why should I believe that account as opposed to maybe like the book of the Latter-day Saints or the Quran? Excellent question. That's a great question because there's evidence that the New Testament accounts were written early by eyewitnesses which contain embarrassing testimony they wouldn't have made up, which they died for, uh, which also has extra biblical testimony from outside sources, which has Old Testament prophecy behind it, which has elaborate testimony that you couldn't explain unless they were eyewitnesses. In fact, your own Tim McGrew talks about that. It's called uh, undesigned coincidences. Uh, there's archaeological evidence which backs it all up. Whereas if you look at the Quran, let's just take a look at the Quran. The Quran was uh, written after Muhammad died. He died in 632 AD. It was standardized by the third Muslim caliph, Ultman, in 650 AD. And the Quran does not contain any miracles done by Muhammad. All the miracles attributed to Muhammad were attributed to him about 150 years or so later in the Hadith, the written traditions and sayings of what Muhammad said and did. So there are no eyewitnesses, eyewitness miracles of Muhammad. In fact, Muhammad denied doing miracles. Now, in the Quran, it says Jesus never died or rose from the dead. A substitute was put in its place. That's Surah 4, verse 157. This book is written over 600 years after the events. But you go back to the New Testament, and you've got eight or nine sources, depending upon who wrote the book of Hebrews, which has all of this evidence in it, which has been verified to be eyewitness testimony, and there's archaeological evidence behind it, that indicates that Jesus really did die and rise from the dead. Well, he certainly died, we know that. Even the great skeptic Bart Ehrman admits he died. Uh, there's no ancient historian who says that what the Quran says is true regarding Jesus. Even atheists admit Jesus died on the cross in, in 30 or 33 AD. So if you're going to look to a book to, to tell you what happened to Jesus, or you're going to look at a book that came 600 years after the events, or you're going to look at a collection of eyewitness documents written by contemporaries who were there, I'm going to go with the people who were there. Now, when you get to the Latter-day Saints, that's obviously even much further ahead. That's in the 1840s. And uh, they're adding books to the Bible and saying that the Bible hasn't been translated right or that it hasn't been copied right or whatever. And uh, the Mormon view doesn't mean every Mormon believes this, but Mormons are polytheists. As man is, God once was. So they're adding a whole nother realm to the Christian worldview and actually going from theism to polytheism. And if you look for archaeological evidence for uh, the Jews here in North America or anything the, Mor the Book of Mormon talks about it, talks about, you will not find it. So that's why. And our book goes into great detail, by the way, Matthew. Here's a follow-up. Go ahead. You follow-up. Yeah. Well, I was just going to ask if, if you believe there are any prophets that would have um, come after John then, I believe, or if it just kind of I think the there. canon is closed since Revelation. I, I, don't, I don't think there's more apostles that are getting new revelation now. I think that we have enough revelation there to keep us busy, and we know enough about you know, what, we're, what, we're, what life's about and, when, and, and that Jesus is one day going to come back. We don't really need any more new revelation. I can't live up to what's already given. So... All right, thank you. All right, thanks, Matthew. Okay, I think we're a little over time. I think we can take one more question if anyone has one. I was under the impression we could go longer. Don't we have till 10 if we need it? Or no? uh, I think, believe we have the room until we need to be out of here by 9.30, I believe. Is that true? Yeah. Around then, yeah. John so. says maybe. All right, well, we can take a few more if we yeah, got we it. We can keep going. Just okay. Yes, sir, what's your name? Yannick. Say again? Yannick. Yanni? Yannick. 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 What's on your shirt? It's Skinner. Skinner. Oh, we have Skinner. Okay. Go ahead. Um, so it is a play on words. All right. What would Skinner <laughs> do? <laughs> um, so I haven't really formulated this question completely, but uh, how would you answer the um, question coming from either uh, someone from psychology or from neuro neurology stating, uh, in a sense, d determinism based on uh, just 
yes. stimulus input that, stimulus yeah. and uh, behavioral output. That is an excellent question. I'm glad you brought it up, Yannick. Probably the easiest way to point out that scientists will never discover we're made of materials is that in order to make such a discovery, they will have to assume that we're not made of materials. Could you clarify that? Okay. Um, how do scientists, when they look at the data, you know, they'll go in and they'll, they'll stimulate a part of the brain and then the person will have to say, um, or the, the, um, the doctor will say, what are you thinking about? Well, I'm thinking about X. Well, maybe the neurologist can associate certain parts of the brain with certain thoughts or certain feelings or certain emotions. That certainly can be done. But in order to get that data and evaluate it, the doctor or the scientist has to assume that he is not just the same kind of molecular machine in order to evaluate the data and come to a conclusion. If he's just a molecular machine as he's evaluating somebody else's brain, how can he be sure his results are true? See what I'm saying? And I, I guess what I'm I'm with you right here. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I, um, I, for me, one of the biggest challenges is exactly the claim for naturalism, like full naturalism, full determinism, uh, which I think in, in a lot of today's scientific realm, we've um, we've driven we've. We've drove away a little bit from the dualistic aspect, right. having the, the little man inside your mind, right. uh, and it's explained away uh, via just stimulus inputs. Mm -hmm. There's neurological processes going on, and but, but, then but, but the problem in order to discover those neurological processes is you'd have to be a free will soul that can evaluate the data objectively and discover these correlations between minds or brain states and behavior. In order to do that, you can't just be a molecular machine because you, you, there'd be no way to trust your results because the very process of you doing the experiment, you're a molecular machine, so why should you believe what you're doing, you see? So, it, it, the, the, oddly enough, in order, in order for a scientist to discover that materialism is true, the scientist has to assume materialism's faults. You see what I'm saying? It's a self-defeating proposition. Good question, though. Yes, sir. What's your name? My name's Tim. Hey, Tim. You know what Tim means? Tell me. Make me a sandwich. No, it doesn't mean that. I'm just kidding. <laughs> it doesn't mean that to me. Um, I have two very closely related questions. Um, so uh, I, I have a degree in apologetics, and I now work in a church. And Where'd you um, get your degree? I got a Bachelor in Apologetic, Worldviews and Apologetics from Boyce College. They're the undergrad of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Oh, where, whereabouts? That's in Louisville, Kentucky. Oh, good. That's okay. where Al Moeller is. Sure. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, anyways, I work in a church now, and I'm very convinced, um, especially through the works of Nancy Piercy, uh -huh. of the importance of teaching things like the importance of absolute truth right. and arguing there because... Um, I totally see um, in different teen ministries I'm involved in throughout the community that I see a lot of Christ teens who'd say they're Christians and very well probably are, and they say that um, they believe everything we teach them, you know, but there's this uh, secular worldview that's come in that has told them that that's what's right for them. Mm -hmm. And so they believe it, but they believe it's what's right for them, and they don't believe it's an absolute truth, and then there's not as much passion and things like that. So the two questions, I guess, are, one, um, what are some ways a guy working in a church like me could help in regular teaching and things like that help I don't teach things like you're saying right here, that there is absolute truth. Um, and the second question kind of goes with it. How can I convince other people within the church, like elders and other leaders within the church, the importance of, I guess, apologetics? Yeah, those are excellent questions. One thing you can do is come to our Cross-Examine Instructor Academy this August. It's our seventh annual 
myself, Greg Kokel, Jay Warner Wallace, a cold case homicide detective, Ted Wright, our executive director, Richard Howe, several other people teach uh, for three days. People like you who are already have an apologetic base, how to present material like this and how to deal with questions. Getting people uh, excited about it, if I had the answer to that, that would be, you know, that'd be gold. I, I, do, I do see this though, most people, except the good people here, when they hear about an apologetic event, they, uh, maybe I'll go, maybe I won't. Those that come get excited because, well, I never knew this stuff existed. In fact, we were over in Denmark, did a debate before over a thousand people, and there were several people there who said, I've never heard any of these arguments. Mal, I, they, they went from one, I know one guy went from atheism to Christianity, another guy just went from, or a bunch of guys went from atheism to agnosticism because they had never heard arguments for God. So sometimes just getting some of the evidence out there is enough to convince people. Now from uh, a pragmatic level, 75% of young people who are brought up in the church walk away from the church once they leave the home. It's not all intellectual, but some of it is. And so from a pragmatic level, you want to get them evidence. And also it's commanded in the Bible. If you're a Christian, you know, uh, Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Paul says, demolish arguments in 2 Corinthians 10.5. Peter says, always be ready to give an answer for the hope that you have. So that would be my advice. If you go to our website, crossexamine.org, it's all up there. And get our app, too. The app is free, so get the kids to download it, and they can go through the stuff for themselves. All right, well, thank you. All right, thanks, Tim. Thanks for what you're doing. All righty, folks. Hey. Thanks, Kat. All right, folks, thank you so much for being here. Check out our app. Please download it and sign up for our email, too. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And thanks to Ratio Christie. Yep, thanks for coming out. Check us out on Tuesday nights.